Hello and welcome again. The topic, Moses in the dispensation of God's providence to restore the world. Let's recall that God in his heart had the original ideal of creation that he wanted to see manifested in his true son and daughter, Adam and Eve. Because of the fall, Satan dominated Adam and Eve and has subsequently dominated history from that time. And yet, God, as a God of love, has worked to restore the world back to the original ideal that would have been founded in the garden. The Messiah has to come in the position of true Adam. Before the Messiah can come, humankind must make a condition to restore a foundation for the Messiah. And that foundation will expand from a family level to a national level to eventually a world level when Jesus will come. God uses a model course in the subjugation of Satan. I want you to remember that term, the model course. The reason is that the purpose of God's dispensation is to establish a foundation on earth where humankind will naturally subjugate and bring into submission the power of, of Satan. Now, we understand that Satan did not obey God nor did Satan obey Jesus, and Jesus was in the position of the true parent or our ancestor. So if Satan would not be able to obey them, somehow he was not going to be able to obey us. And yet our purpose of restoration is to subjugate the power of evil. That's why God has taken responsibility to make Satan submit, and he's established that power through a model course established in the time of Jacob. When God worked through Jacob, Overcoming the power of resentment in Esau, it was not two young men fighting out a, a quarrel between them. It was a providential battle of God versus Satan. What happened is God won victory over Satan when Jacob was able to voluntarily enforce a submission of Esau by melting his heart. Therefore, Jacob's course serves as a pattern for Moses' course. And Moses' course is the pattern for Jesus. You know, we read that Jesus, as the Messiah, teaches us to substantially subjugate Satan in the world. And Jesus was bound to follow the pattern established by Moses. Let's refer to the book of Acts 3.22. We're reading here of Moses' statement, The Lord God will raise up a prophet for you from your brethren. As he raised me up, you shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And in John 5:19, a reference of Jesus' pattern under the fo uh, following the pattern of Moses. Truly I say, the Son of Man can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever he does, the Son does likewise. Moses was Jesus' model. And on the foundation of that model, we are able to identify a pattern by which Jesus truly enforced a subjugation of the devil. Remember, as we read in the book of Matthew 16 and 24, if any man should follow me, he should deny himself and take up his cross. For he who tries to save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life will gain it. How is it that we can follow the master? It is that we have to learn how to actually subjugate Satan in our life. And in my opinion, in unificationism, this uh, perception or this understanding of the dynamic between uh, Jacob, Moses, and Jesus is very, very important for our own individual ministry. So we'd like to begin this discussion by comparing the courses of Jacob, Moses, and Jesus. We're going to find an uncanny resemblance between the three. First of all, again, the essence of Jacob's course, the essence is that he was able to draw Esau into a position of voluntary submission. He melted Esau's heart. Remember that final moment when they embraced each other in tears. That was a moment in which the foundation of anger and hatred that Cain had towards Abel was melted and restored from, from earth. Now, Jacob's course serves as the model. Moses builds upon that course on the national level, Jacob the family level. Jesus comes on the world stage to bring the kingdom. There are several incredible uh, resemblances of these. I refer here to the trial of faith, one, the trial of faith, in which Moses, Jacob, and Jesus all had to fight for their life 
in order to prove their substance as righteous people. Jacob had to go through an ordeal of being tested by an angel. Moses was tested by God at the risk of his life before he was able to take the people into the wilderness. And of course, Jesus in his 40 days in the desert and the three temptations fought against the angel. We find another similarity in that of the issue of flesh and spirit in which as a result of the fall, the spiritual and physical aspects of human life were dominated by Satan. Consequently, Jacob comes to offer a symbol of the flesh and spirit in the pottage and bread that he gave his brother Esau for the birthright. Moses was given manna and quail, symbolizing the flesh and the spirit. Jesus taught us that in order to embark upon a new covenant, we had to drink the, the body and the blood. We had to eat the body and drink the blood, the bread and the wine, symbolizing the flesh and the spirit. We find another similarity, that of the issue of the body. Fascinating that Jacob's body was embalmed and worshipped and blessed and protected from Satan's invasion in a way after he died. There were squabbles around Moses' body between the archangel and Satan, as we re find recorded in Jude 1.9. And finally, uh, we, we know, of course, that the supernatural and f fascinating events that occurred around Jesus' body after he died. In other words, the body was kept protected from Satan. There were similarities of num numerical aspects. Jacob, Moses, and Jesus all had to endure a three-day period, uh, an ordeal, a test of faith. They all had a group of 12 disciples, or 12, a foundation of 12, Jacob's sons, Moses' tribes, Jesus' apostles. They all had to deal with the number 70, where there were 70 uh, kinsmen to Jacob, 70, uh, tri uh, 70 uh, elders to Moses, and 70 disciples to Jesus. We find the similarities in the three courses of the staff, which is used to smite injustice, to show the way, to support the prophet. And Jesus was the living rod of iron, the rod that we read of in the book of Revelation. Moses carried the staff. Jacob used the staff. There was another similarity of the mother and son cooperation. And we find others as the three men lead us out of the satanic world into the heavenly world. And finally, the destruction of evil is their ultimate purpose. Jacob buried the idols from his, his uh, uncle. Moses had to destroy evil and through the miracles and calamities. And of course, this was Jesus' fundamental purpose. The similarities are amazing. Now this brings us to examine the course of Moses, and we do that by starting with an overview. Moses' foundation is based on the past. There has to be a foundation of faith and a foundation of substance. Moses was somewhat unique in that he stood upon the victorious basis of Isaac, and he also worked on the national level. God asked him to move the people out of Egypt into Canaan, symbolizing moving into the kingdom of heaven. And God worked, therefore, to restore the kingdom on the national level. God, remember now, God is a tactician. God is a strategist. God is an engineer. God is a commander-in-chief working to restore a heavenly world on the national level. Jacob was the family level. Then the foundation of faith was necessary. They remember the vertical basis in which Moses stood as a central figure. His foundation of faith was based upon the number 40, representing a separation from Satan. He accomplished this foundation in the 40 years of his life in the palace. His mother was the nurse, and she instilled in him an incredible awareness of God. She brought to him an awareness of the precious heritage of his people. He eventually drew away from the palace, growing tired of the riches of the palace and being drawn to the humble life of the Israelites. And he stood here as a model for Jesus. We know now from the, from the book of Exodus 4 and 16 that Moses was one who represented God to the people. Moses represented God as we read God speaking to Moses about Aaron, that God would speak through Moses, through Aaron's mouth, representing Moses, and Moses would represent God. He shall be as God to the people. Now the offering was at 40 years and the, uh, this would issue in a new age of the Word of God, a new age of the Word. 
In the past, they were animal sacrifices offered by the time of Abraham. Now we are moving into a new phase of the Word of God. This is the basis of the foundation of faith. The foundation of substance would come as Israel would bind together with Moses, overcoming their fallen nature, sacrificing themselves, submitting to Moses as their leader, and obeying him as they passed from Egypt into Canaan. And on this basis, they would make the foundation for the Messiah. If Moses had accomplished this vertical basis and the Israelites the horizontal unity, the foundation for the Messiah would have been established. Jesus would have come at that time. They would have absolved their original sin, accomplished the original nature, and established God's kingdom upon the earth. Tragically, because of faithlessness, the Israelites not only failed to accomplish this foundation, but they prolonged the process twice. This brings us to the first of three phases of Moses' destiny. We call that the first course of national restoration into Canaan. To qualify as the central figure, Moses, as I mentioned, endured a 40-year period in the palace. He eventually left and joined with his own people. He established that victorious foundation of faith by enduring this period which resembled being in the satanic world and yet maintaining his faith. The essence of the foundation is he left the temple with the heart to serve Israel. God is working through him. And now he makes the providence of the start. How does he do that? But he kills an Egyptian who is uh, causing problems for one of his kinsmen one of the Israelites. Moses kills the Egyptian. He was not murdering out of malice, but murdering because he was protecting the life of the Israelite. And Moses knew that if, he had been, it, if it had been found out that he killed the Egyptian, his life in the palace would end. What happened? Instead of being supported by the Israelites, Moses was turned in. He was exposed. And as a result of being exposed, the Pharaoh was able to see that Moses, uh, that the Israelites were not binding with Moses. And as a result, the Israelites were not able to support him. God feared that the Israelites would retreat if they would go directly into the desert. And now he can see that there is this budding embryo of faithlessness. Moses had to escape. He was never able to begin the first course of restoration into Canaan. And as a result, he spent the next 40 years in Midian. We read in Exodus 2.15, when Pharaoh heard of the murder, he sought to kill Moses. And as a result, the first course of restoration of taking the people out of Egypt into Canaan ended up in failure. It was wiped out. Please remember the issue of the covenant God is able to work when we establish the covenant of faith. Not because God predestines Israel to act like a robot, but because the people follow, because they respond to the Lord. A covenant is established and God is able to work His process. We go on to see this dynamic again in the second attempt to lead the people out of Egypt into Canaan. Again, we begin with the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance. The first course fizzled out. It could not be established. So Moses went into Midian. He spent 40 years there in the, in the wilderness. And on that foundation, after 40 years of patient waiting, Exodus 3, 7, we read the word of God. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. God revealed to Moses, go into Egypt get the people and bring them out. Now he had his mandate. He had his mandate. And what happens? The new dispensation begins. Moses enters Egypt. He is given the power of God with the three miracles, the ten calamities. The Israelite people awaken and they see that their God has given them truly a leader in whom God was dwelling. That was the function. That was the purpose of the miracles and calamities. Pharaoh was afraid, and the Israelites drew their attention to Moses because they saw in him a man of the Lord. On this foundation, they now were able to move out of Egypt into the desert. Now, God knew the faith of the Israelites was limited, 
Examine for yourself here. I won't read the whole text, but in, uh, look up later. Exodus 13, verse 17. He, God knew the Israelites feared the battle if they passed through the land of the Philistines. And as a result, even though our Lord wanted to pass through the land of the Philistines, he couldn't. He was afraid the Israelites would become faithless. Fearing fighting, fearing the fight, they would turn back and go to Egypt. At all costs, God has to avoid that. So our Lord God made it difficult for, Egypt, for the Israelites to fail. He had to make some basis by which he could ensure a victory. How did he do it? How did God plant within the Israelites some way to keep them on target, a compass, so to speak? A compass. That compass, that vector, that arrow was the tabernacle. The tabernacle has such powerful, mystical presence. We're going to examine the tabernacle now in the dispensation for restoration. Now, as they left, or getting ready to leave Egypt, God told the people, centering on Moses, that Moses should consecrate them. He should reinforce their faith. Look, uh, the, reinforce their faith. I get so excited here. I, I want to slow down so you can really understand here how God is working. But the course of Moses, to me, is absolute proof that the unification principle is true. Absolute proof. Look for yourself in Exodus 19, verse 10. We find the people are needed to be consecrated. Moses takes the 70 elders up to the Mount Sinai, and God shows his glory to the people. In Exodus 24, 17, read of this account. Follow with me, if you will. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of a mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Our God showed that he was with his people. He showed that he was with Israel, that he was investing his total effort in Israel. He wanted to prove to the people beyond any shadow of a doubt that they could trust him. And he needed their trust in order to fend off the accusation of Satan. Let's not forget, God is guiding us, this chosen people, to fight against the onslaught of the principality of darkness. It is a life and death struggle. It is not simply an Old Testament epic that we can make movies about. It is a life and death struggle no less significant than our day today in this country. On this basis, Moses calls, God calls Moses to fast for 40 days. On the foundation of that fast, Moses received the two tablets and ten commandments. You'll read in the 24th chapter of Exodus, the 18th verse. He received instructions to build the Ark of the Covenant on this foundation, and then he descended the mountain. As he came down Mount Sinai, we know well what he saw. He found the people with Aaron uh, faithless. They forgot who they were. They forgot the covenant that God had made with them. They forgot where they were going. In 40 days, they were not able to maintain their covenant with God. They built a golden calf that represented Satan. And Moses was so frustrated and angered that he took the tablets of stone, threw them down at the base of the mountain, grabbed the calf and destroyed it, melted down the calf, sprinkled over the powder of the ashes of the calf in water and made him drink it. It was a defiling of the covenant that Israel had witnessed with God. And now Moses had to uh, again fast for 40 days to restore this foundation of faith so that God again in Exodus 34 verse 1 commanded Moses to make two new tablets out of the old ones. Israel repented, centering on Aaron, and they built the ark and they began the course of Exodus and uh, en route to Canaan. Now, I'd like to mention a word here about the significance of the tablets and the significant of the ark, significance of the Ark of the Covenant. Adam and Eve were created by the Word of God. And as, if they had manifested the Word in their flesh, without question, they would become the living embodiment of God on earth and their descendants would be the same. In that sense, Adam and Eve, because of the fall, lost the Word of God. Then let's think for a minute what the tablets represent, the Ten Commandments, which we 
uh, so easily take for granted in history. The tablets had a special meaning. For the first time now in human events, God has substantially represented his words on the earth in a tablet. Now think for a moment, if you will, of the difference in Western civilization before and after the Bible was written down on paper, or before and after Gutenberg printed the, uh, established the printing press and the Bible could be distributed to the corners of the earth. Consider how significant it is that we can write on paper and people can read the Word of God. This is the first time, not on paper, but on stone, that there is a substantial symbol of God's word on the earth. It represented true Adam and true Eve, and as a result, it represented Jesus and the Holy Spirit. That's how significant the course of the, uh, of the uh, stone was. We read in Revelations 2.17 that Jesus is referred to as a white stone, and in 1 Corinthians 10.4, he's referred to as the, living, the rock from which living water comes. You know, from that standpoint, I want you to pray upon this, this point I'm going to mention. Consider the significance of the fact that in this day and age, we can make a sermon such as this and produce it on a videotape and that you can watch this. I want you to pray about the potential significance of even these videotapes. There is a similarity to the whole history of God revealing his words if you have the ears to hear it. And I mention that humbly, and I simply ask you to pray upon, upon this this idea. Now, we see that the dispensational age is transformed. God is able to reveal his word directly to humankind. And this is important. Now he begins to build, and we look at the nature of the, of the tabernacle. The tabernacle uh, was called by John, in the Gospel of John 2 and 21, Jesus compares the temple to his body. And Paul says Christians are to be the temples of God, the temples of the living God in 1 Corinthians 3.16. In this sense, the temple is the image representation of the Messiah. The temple was not simply a thing that the Israelites built, but it was an image of the coming of the Messiah. And in that sense, the relationship of the Israelites to the temple should be uh, resonant with the relationship that they would have with the living Messiah, the living God on earth. That's how important the, the role of the tabernacle and the temple played. Now, the temple could not be built on the earth at that time. They were wandering in the desert. And as a result, they built this tabernacle, a mobile, a mobile temple, if you will. And the relationship with the tabernacle, therefore, was incredibly important. You know, we read a beautiful verse in the 25th chapter of Exodus, verse 8. Let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. In this sense, the Israelites would have attended the Messiah symbolically in the wilderness. Establishing the tabernacle was symbolically, uh, uh, it was symbolically equal to establishing the life of Christ right there. Well, this brings us now to the purpose of the dispensation of the tablets in the tabernacle. From God's viewpoint, once Israel left Egypt, it was imperative that they make it all the way to Canaan. Regardless of the cost, they had to make it to Canaan. And therefore, God gave them incredible miracles. The miracles that were given were there to prompt them, to educate them, to convince them that God was real. And God cared and guided for them in numerous ways. There was the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, the splitting of the waters of the Red Sea, the manna and the quail, the rock that gave water, and the defeat of the Amalekites. Still, Israel lost faith in Moses and in God so often. And even though uh, Moses was a great and faithful patriarch, there was the danger in God's mind that even Moses might do something faithless. Consequently, our Heavenly Father, in his brilliance, established an object of faith that would not change. And that object of faith would be such that if even one person united with that object of faith, absolutely determined to remain with that object, then God would bless that one person and that, but that uh, object could be passed on like a baton. This is the significance of the tabernacle, which enshrined the ark, 
which in turn enshrined the tablets. So until they entered Canaan, the Israelite people had to continue to follow Moses and attend the ideal of the tabernacle with loyalty that they would give to the Messiah himself. And this is the national foundation of substance. Follow Moses, obey the ideal of the tabernacle. Think for yourself the significance of a church building in your neighborhood. There was a church building, a well-known United Methodist uh, church that burned down tragically just a couple of days ago in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And as I read in the newspaper, the people in the neighborhood, which is a kind of a, uh, a neighborhood that's suffering economically, they were really uh, lamenting because this one chapel, this beautiful flagship church, had now burned down, suspected vandalism. The point here is that the church symbolizes physically the ideal of Christianity. Now think for yourself practically, realistically, in the desert, how important the tabernacle would have been. Well, this brings us now to the foundation of the tabernacle. If the, if the tabernacle is so important, what's the basis that Moses had to make in order to receive the tabernacle? Remember, we're fighting against the demonic power of Satan. We're fighting to build a foundation on the earth, and it don't come easy. What happens? On this foundation, Moses had to fast uh, for 40 days on Mount Sinai, and next the people would love and obey him serve him, unite with him. And passing through the desert, they would uh, enter into Canaan. The people, however, were found to be faithless, and they established the golden calf. Moses was angered. He threw the tablets down. Now, what did it mean that he threw the tablets down? It meant that a condition was made in which Moses became angry because the people were faithless. Throwing the tablets down to the base of the mountain, the tablets represent Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the living word, the embodiment of God's will. By throwing the tablets down in anger at the faithlessness of the people, we have a precedent or an opening through which Satan can invade Jesus later. What I mean here is that Satan will confront Jesus directly because of the base that was made by throwing the commandments down to the, to the ground. So, the point here is that uh, Moses began a second foundation. The people repented. They joined together with Moses, and they began to follow him into the desert. Even as they did, they complained. They made a new beginning, but still they complained, and they left the wilderness for Canaan. They complained as they left the wilderness, under a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And as a result, God burned the corner of their camp in Numbers 11, verse 1. And later they continued to complain as they went through the desert, asking even to go back to Egypt. Again, a 40-day period of separation occurred. God uh, took 12 spies, sent them into Canaan. Only two came back victoriously, giving reports of faith and confidence. And as a result of this, a difficulty emerged in the, in the chosen people. They continued to complain, fearful because of the reports, and they then told Moses that they wanted even a new leader. Read for yourself in Numbers 13, verse 28. God then appeared to Moses and said, How long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs which I have wrought among them? And finally, Moses was uh, now to begin a third course into the wilderness, in which instead of passing through the wilderness quickly, they had to remain in the wilderness for 40 years. The foundation of faith had to be reestablished, and that was based upon the 40 years of wandering that ended up in Kadesh Barnea. They, ex they exalted the ideal of the temple, and as a result, sanctified that foundation of faith. The foundation of substance would be their unity with Moses through that course. Now, they made that unity, but in the end, Moses himself made an error. And they went eventually into Canaan, as you read, with Joshua. The foundation of substance centering on Moses then. God was anxious. He gave them so much grace, the tablets, the tabernacle, the ark, but still he was anxious. And the two uh, spies came back. Uh, the, the condition for Satan to attack the Israelites was set up. So eventually, 
Um, if the Israelites had followed Moses, uh, absolutely, to the end of Kadesh Barnea, they would have exalted the ideal of the tabernacle and eventually enter Canaan victoriously. Well, what happened? When they got to the, um, to the uh, Kadesh Barnea, the rock there, they murmured in resentment that they were thirsty. And they asked for water. God gave them then the chance to have water. And what happened? Moses was to strike the rock twice, to strike the rock once. In his anger, because of the resentment that they felt from the people, Moses struck the rock twice. And as a result of striking the rock twice, he was unable or forbidden by God to go into Canaan. We read in the book of, of uh, Deuteronomy 3.25, God has now told Moses that you cannot go into, into Canaan. Moses begs God that he can go with the Israelites. Imagine all the work that Moses has done, all the effort that he has made. And he says, let me go over, I pray, and see the good land beyond the Jordan, the goodly hill country in Lebanon, and God speaks back to Moses in the next verse of Deuteronomy 3.26, Speak to me no more of this matter. Moses died on Mount Pisgah. He died without ever being able to step foot into Canaan. And we can simply imagine how God must have felt and how Moses must have felt. They live in a covenant. And now Moses had made a mistake which prevented him from going into the land of Canaan. The essence of the mistake I will not explain in detail. I do encourage you to examine the text of the unification principle here to understand in, in greater depth. But the essence of it is that by striking the rock twice, the rock symbolized fallen Adam. Fallen Adam. By striking the rock one time, Moses makes the condition of indemnity whereby fallen Adam becomes true Adam. Therefore, the rock of the living Christ can come. The water of the living Christ comes from Christ, the rock. By striking the rock twice, it demonstrates symbolically the mind or the heart to, uh, to hit the Christ figure, to hit the risen Adam. And in that fashion, it opens up the gate again, another precedent. Because of the breakdown of the covenant, God sees the possibility here for even Jesus to be hit by Satan. Again, God's desire is not that Moses stays out. God wants Moses to go into Canaan. We know from the scripture that it was Joshua who enters Canaan. Joshua is the one who leads them. Uh, the mission of Moses being given unto Joshua, and we read in the 27th chapter of Numbers, the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, invest him with your authority that all the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. Then Joshua goes into Canaan. In Deuteronomy 3.28, we read God's words to Joshua. He shall go over at the head of his people and shall put them in possession of the land which you shall see. And in Joshua 1, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. The Lord speaks to Joshua. Therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people into the land which I give Israel. Now the second generation of Israel that had been born in the desert united with Joshua completely and was willing to support him at all costs. Eventually they all went into uh, Canaan according to the way God desired them to enter Canaan. Eventually with the 40,000 soldiers and the priests and the Levites, they surrounded the uh, castle of Jericho, as you know the story very well, and based upon their faith, based upon their covenant, based upon fulfilling their responsibility, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Not because God programmed the situation, but because the real human beings in that situation really took responsibility to accomplish the foundation to uh, maintain the covenant. The summary here is that uh, uh, the second generation of Israel enters Canaan. They establish the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance, but still, because of their faithlessness, after they entered Canaan, they were still not able to maintain God's blessing, and God had to prolong the providence for many, many times. Uh, another point I'd like to mention here is that the foundation that the Israelites made here in the uh, uh, Canaan had to be expanded simply because 
the sovereignty of the evil world had already raced ahead since the time of Adam. God wants to then confront that sovereignty. Moses' course is a foundation which undeniably stands as the basis for our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, when Jesus conducted his ministry on earth, he did not work in a vacuum. Jesus came to teach us to substantially subjugate Satan. Now, the Israelites at the time of John the Baptist also fell into faithlessness, and the result is that Jesus' worldwide course ends up with the crucifixion. We're going to examine now Jesus' course, Jesus' course in the providence of restoration. And again, let's remember we've zoomed from Jacob on the family level, the tribe level. We zoom up to Moses on the national scale, and we expand outward to the world level where Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the only begotten Son of God, who comes as the Christ and the Messiah to save the world and establish his kingdom, is now given this worldwide foundation. There has to be a foundation of faith and substance prepared. The central figure of the foundation of faith is who? You could probably answer yourself by now. I hope you were right. It's John the Baptist. John the Baptist now comes representing all the central figures of history. In the lineage of righteousness from Abel to Noah to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way through Moses and eventually to the point of John. He was born to make straight the way of the Lord, as you read in John 1 and 23, and look to Matthew 11 and 11 to see him born as the greatest of women. Now, God sent John the, the Baptist in the position of Elijah. Elijah was a prophet who came to teach the people to unite the people. So, the... Uh, uh, position of John was one in which he plays the role of the central figure. He established the foundation of faith by his life of faith. An ascetic, he was very holy, and he was able to prepare that foundation of faith through his life. 400 years of preparation from the time of the building of the temple under Malachi. The foundation of substance would be established here through the unity of the chosen people with John. And as we understand in the New Testament, the chosen people were so eager to follow John that they thought he might even be the Messiah. John the Baptist might be the one. And we see that the chosen people followed John. They, they thought in the, in the book of Luke 3.15, I believe it is, what then will this child be for the hand of the Lord was with him? Thus, the people of Judea, who were in the Cain position, believed in John the Baptist and followed him as if he were the Messiah himself. This established the foundation of substance. Now we come to the foundation to receive the Messiah. The people united with the central figure in faith are there waiting for the fruit of human history. What occurs? The foundation for the Messiah are the people who are prepared to serve and attend the Messiah and to fulfill his will. This means that as the representative of all the central people of history, John the Baptist stands and has to now lead the people forward to accept Jesus. Tragically, as we described in an earlier session together here, John did not follow Jesus. I know that may be provocative. I ask you to look for yourself in John 1 and 29 through 34. He came to doubt that Jesus was the Messiah. Again, I know this is new, but for yourself, look at Matthew 11 and 3. He asked whether or not Jesus was the Christ. And eventually John, having the revelation from the Holy Spirit that the Son of God was there, was not able to serve Jesus. He should have bound together with him and helped Jesus in his ministry. I know the kingdom of God is spoken of, not of this world. But Jesus also prayed that the kingdom would come to the earth. And Jesus needed John's help. On this foundation, John denied that he was Elijah when Jesus said he was Elijah. We read that in John 1, 21. And eventually John, by denying that he was Elijah, caused incredible confusion in the people. This opened the way for Satan to directly confront Jesus. This act of faithlessness on the part of John there led, led to the confusion of the chosen people, and this opened the window through which Satan, hungry as a vicious a blind and, and evil-filled monster wants to attack 
our Lord and Savior Jesus, to prevent him from establishing the kingdom of God upon the earth. Let's remember, Satan is the principality of darkness who wants to establish his foundation on earth, so there is a battle occurring. What occurs here? The foundation for the Messiah actually ended up as a failure. It ended up as a failure. Then, God carefully prepared John the Baptist for Jesus, but John did not follow Jesus, and he lost his qualification as the central figure. He lost his foundation. That's the reason why John ends up going off into the court of Herod, involved in a squabble that he has no business being involved in when the Messiah is on the earth, and Jesus has to continue his ministry on his own. The first course of bringing the world into Canaan, centering on Jesus, was lost. Jesus, of course, did not give up. He initiated what's described now as the second worldwide course of the restoration into Canaan. The central figure now is Jesus himself. John the Baptist failed to establish the position of the central figure of the foundation of faith. Now Jesus stands in that position as the central figure of the foundation of faith. The Messiah can only appear when the Abel figure establishes that vertical base. When Cain unites with Abel, the unity is occurring, and then the Messiah can stand. He can emerge. As long as that satanic base, as long as that foundation was invaded by Satan, Jesus could not commence his work of rebirth. He could not begin his work as the Messiah. He had to rebuild exactly what John failed to do. That's the reason why Jesus immediately went into the desert and what did he do? He fasted for 40 days. He then had to struggle against Satan through the three temptations. And by victoriously sacrificing himself in the fasting of 40 days, he restored the failure of the central figure of faith. Remember Moses' foundation of 40 days fast. Jesus did not come to fast. Jesus did not come to fight against Satan. Jesus came to give us rebirth. Jesus came to build the kingdom of God on the earth. It should have been John who fought against Satan. Upon this foundation, Jesus entered into the struggle with Satan we describe uh, commonly as the three temptations. So let's take a look at the three temptations. The, uh, first of all, we read in Matthew 4, 1 and 10 that Satan tested Jesus through the three temptations. Now, Satan's uh, original purpose is to attack Jesus because Jesus' fundamental purpose is to destroy Satan. That's the reason why Satan and Jesus are going to clash. We have to recognize that Jesus, the historical Jesus, was a person in whom God dwelt who had to fight against evil in this way. Then according to the principle, uh, God wanted Jesus to establish the kingdom of God based upon his words. Satan wanted to annihilate violate, pollute, and take over the kingdom. He wanted to change the world. That's why Satan asked Jesus three very carefully targeted questions that were fundamentally aimed at the heart of the Word of God. And Jesus, our Lord, had to fight not simply by willpower, but he had to answer those questions exactly in line with the principle, exactly in line with the will of God. Let's examine them briefly. The first temptations in Matthew 4 and 3. If you are the Son of God, says the devil to Jesus, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Again, the stones represent the rock, the tablets. They represent, the, uh, the, uh, because of the faithlessness of the chosen people, Moses broke the tablets of stone and struck the rock twice. This provides the basis for Satan to claim the rock, so to speak. What is the rock in the providence? It is a symbol, an image of the Messiah, of true Adam. When the chosen people became faithless, as they did as they wandered in the wilderness, Satan was in a position to attack Jesus, who is the incarnate Word of God, hence the living rock, the, the, the white stone. Jesus was the incarnate Word of God. Consequently, Jesus was hungry after 40 days. And Satan tempts him to change these stones into bread, which symbolically means the hidden meaning behind that bullet is sacrifice your position as true Adam and let me have it. 
Sacrifice it for the sake of yourself. You're feeling exactly what the Israelites felt in the desert, aren't you? Give up the stones. Let me have the ideal. How did our Lord triumphantly slash the will of Satan? Read for yourself in Matthew 4, verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus dominated or subjugated the devil in that moment. He was able to establish the centrality or the subjectivity of the Word of God. And in that way, he overcame what was a test for the sanctity of the first blessing. I hope you can remember the first blessing to be fruitful, to maintain or to establish individual perfection. Then, on this foundation, Satan came in for his second wave of attack. We read in Matthew 4 and 6, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down upon the temple. He led him up on the temple, the pinnacle of the temple. Jesus referred to himself in, as a temple in John 2.21. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul refers to us as the temples of God. In 1 Corinthians 12.27, it tells us that we are to be the believers as members of the body of Christ. Therefore, Jesus is the main temple and we are the branch temples. From this standpoint, Satan had to recognize Jesus' authority on the basis of uh, establishing victory of the first temptation. And he also now wants to tempt him to give up his position as the master of the temple, to throw him down and be as a fallen man and put his end to restoring himself as the branch, as the main temple, and then restore us as the branch temple. And what does uh, Jesus do? This fundamental attack, driving at Jesus' position now as the Son of God, is answered. Matthew 4 and 7. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. In other words, we understand from the time of the fall that the angelic realm should be su uh, subjected to the dominion of humankind. Lucifer stood out of his position and dominated Adam and Eve. Consequently, Jesus now is reclaiming that position with Satan, putting Satan in the position where you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not tell me that I should evacuate my position as a temple. Consequently, again, Jesus, with the sword of truth, slays the, the, the demon. He slays the power of, of Satan, pushes him back, and a condition for the restoration of the second blessing was established. Finally, we come to the third temptation in which Matthew 4 and 9 recites, All these I give you, says the devil, if you will fall down and worship me. On this basis, we can see the third blessing being attacked. A condition is made to restore the third blessing in which Jesus now fights back to the Satan and says in Matthew 4 and 10, You shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. In other words, Jesus, as the true Son of God, is in the position to dominate the creation now. And by doing this, he establishes the, the basis to, to, to dominate the creation by fighting off the temptation. Let's remember here in summary that by overcoming the first two temptations, Jesus establishes the foundation that enables him to restore the first and second blessing. The third temptation is the third blessing, uh, establishing the third blessing. The overall condition here is now Jesus is in the place of John the Baptist. He establishes the foundation of faith as the central figure. Now, remember, John failed his purpose. The position of the central figure of the foundation of faith is evacuated. Jesus, before he can commence his work of rebirth, stands in that position and has now restored it. He goes on to establish the foundation of substance. This means that the Cain figure has to unite with him. Who is in the position of Cain? But it is the chosen people of Israel. Jacob is played by Jesus. Esau is played by Israel. Their covenant is the basis upon which God can work. The relationship between Jesus and Israel, therefore, is the central issue, the central issue of God's providence in that moment. Now, in order to begin to give total rebirth, he has to claim that unity. And on the basis of that unity, Jesus can then rise up in the position of Messiah and commence his work of rebirth. 
He began with the work of miracles. He tried to encourage the people that he was truly a man of God. And yet, it was the very people who uh, were the, the, the most prepared, the leaders, the ones in the front ranks, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those were the ones who declared Jesus was a sinner in John 9, 16. And Jesus found people taking up stones to throw at him. They wanted to kill him already in John 8, 59. And we read in John 7 and 1 that he eventually uh, had to take refuge for a short time because the people were after him. And meanwhile, Satan, as we read in Luke 4 and 13, I do encourage you to look up that scripture, 4, 13 of Luke, Satan retreated for the opportune time, knowing now that he could not penetrate Jesus' faith directly, but he could penetrate the heart and mind of the chosen people and work indirectly through them. So the people's attitude toward Jesus went sim beyond simple ignorance here. They developed a strong feeling of disbelief and distrust towards our Lord to the point where eventually they feared him, they felt threatened by him, and they eventually led him to the cross. So because of the faithlessness of the chosen people, the foundation of substance in which the chosen people had to overcome their fallen nature, submit to and obey the will of God through Jesus, failed. They submitted to the power of evil within them, and Satan was able to then attack the work of the Lord at that moment. Jesus was crucified. I realize sincerely that this presents a provocative an innovative perspective of the ministry of Jesus. And again, all we can say is that we have to pray. We have to ask Jesus deeply. Read the scripture again. Look at the scripture from this viewpoint of the principle of restoration. God is real. God is real. And he wants to build a real kingdom. Now, Jesus was in the spiritual world. The foundation of 2,000 years of preparation was wiped out. Israel had failed, and Jesus commenced his operation. He commenced his ministry from the spiritual world. Still, the foundation of faith had to be established, and this brings us to the third course of the, national, or the worldwide restoration of the people into Canaan. Jesus has to take the position of the central figure. Why is it in the scripture we know that Jesus worked for 40 days appearing to his disciples and apostles? encouraging them, doing miraculous things. Did it ever occur to you that this number 40 is not an arbitrary thing that God shoots from the hip? It's not arbitrary at all. It has a very important meaning. The meaning is that Jesus is now reestablishing the foundation of faith. He successfully does that in that 40 year, uh, 40, excuse me, 40 day period after his resurrection. What's the result? The foundation of substance still needs to be accomplished. The foundation of substance still needs to be established. And the chosen people of Israel had failed. And now God is raising up a new Israel, which are the, who are the uh, disciples of Jesus. And Jesus is the root of all life for mankind here. Now, Satan's invasion of Jesus' physical body means that even the saints who were following Jesus, like Paul in Romans 7.22, had to suffer the attack of evil on their physical body. The fact that Satan was able to strike the physical body of Jesus means that all of us have had to endure that ordeal. Still, if our spirit is intact with Jesus, we can be restored and saved spiritually. The foundation of faith was established by the 40 days after the resurrection. The foundation of substance was fulfilled by the people in particular at the moment of Pentecost. We read in Acts 1 and 3, To them he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during those 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. Then we move now to the foundation for the Messiah. The foundation of substance was established when the people united with, with Jesus, and the foundation of the Messiah is actually the basis upon which the Messiah can physically and spiritually save mankind. And yet Jesus' physical body is not there on earth anymore. He's not walking around anymore. He ascended, and he had to commence his providence spiritually. The Holy Spirit remained upon the earth, but Jesus was not. 
The point then is that the foundation for the Messiah had been established and Jesus could begin the basis for rebirth. There was now no accusation, no basis for accusation from Satan. Satan there were no conditions that existed in the realm of resurrection that Jesus had resurrected to. And now the fundamental role of the Messiah could be established. Now the job that Jesus came to perform can be done. Now Jesus was able to give the people rebirth. Now the Holy Spirit and Jesus descended upon the people at the moment of Pentecost when they prayed in supplication and in one accord in the upper room. At that moment, for the first time, the chosen people of Israel now transcending to the Christian body accepted Jesus, they cried out for Jesus, and they opened themselves to him. And that is when the foundation of rebirth occurred. The Messiah comes in order to give rebirth. Jesus was able to give that rebirth to us as Christians. I want you to know, I am saved by Jesus. And yet, like you, I await for his return. The course of restoration of the world into Canaan was only accomplished spiritually. At the time of Jesus' return, we will witness the movement of the world into Canaan physically. That's the reason why the Lord of the Second Coming has to fulfill the process of rebirth, as we read in the book of Revelation, by establishing a new heaven and a new earth. God's will is absolute and has never changed. From the moment of the creation of the universe to this day, in this century, in this country, the purpose of Christianity is providentially identical to the purpose of Israel 2,000 years ago. God bless you and thank you. Hello and welcome. The title of this final presentation is The Second Advent. There could be no more important topic that today in America we would examine. And before beginning, I hope that these tapes are as meaningful for you as they have been for me to make. It's been quite an experience. Well, the second coming of Christ was predicted in the Bible by Jesus' own words. And yet there have been so many different ideas about the second coming of Jesus. Some people believe that his coming occurred at the time of Pentecost. Some think that he has already come in a spiritual fashion. And some are not sure whether he's going to come or not. Perhaps simply a myth or, or uh, a poetic reference. In this aspect of the unification principle, we're going to deal with the question of how Christ will come, when he will come, and where he will come. And I'd first like to direct your attention to the issue of Elijah. We've got a precedent in the Old Testament that sets an incredible model for how God works according to the principle of restoration. Now let's think back. What happened at the time of Elijah? We want to gain insight here on the second coming of Jesus in this time. In Malachi 4 and 5, we read that Elijah was going to be coming back before Christ would, would come 2,000 years ago. And the Old Testament people were so awakened by the desire for Elijah to come that they passionately waited for him. Now, how did Elijah eventually come? We read in Matthew 11:14 that John the Baptist was Elijah. Jesus himself said that John the Baptist was the second coming of Elijah. He said that twice, again in the 17th chapter of Matthew. Even though John didn't comprehend what that meant, John the Baptist really was the second coming of Elijah. Well, what did it mean? How did Elijah return through John? Elijah had a mission to fulfill, which began 900 years before the time of Jesus. And he was not able to finish the mission. He wasn't able to draw the Israelites together and bind them into one. John came on the foundation of all those central figures of history, and his mission was to prepare the way of the Lord, to draw the people together, making, as we discussed earlier, the foundation for the Messiah. John was not successful. And yet still, Jesus said he was the second coming of Elijah. 
Through this lesson of the second coming of Elijah, we can gain very important insight as to how God works when a central figure does not accomplish the mission in a given time and place, and then God has to wait for a later time and place to send somebody else to do the same job. If Adam had not fallen, then Jesus would never have had to come as the last Adam. If Adam had fulfilled his responsibility, Jesus would uh, have, in one sense, no job to fulfill. Now, we're going to see a, an interesting parallel here between the time of Jesus and the modern day today. Well, let's take a look at some of the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus' first coming. We read in the book of Daniel 7.13 that I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. There were people at the time of Jesus' coming who expected him to come on the clouds of heaven precisely as the prophet Daniel predicted. And yet we find another prophecy in the Old Testament. That is, if you refer in your scripture to Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, and we find there a prediction that the Messiah would be born on earth in Bethlehem. Now, which of these two prophecies were true? How could it be that Daniel predicts, and Daniel, you know, was a very important prophet. How could Daniel predict Christ coming in the clouds, and yet Micah on the earth? How do we reconcile these two problems? It was a problem, we know, from the New Testament back in the uh, time of Jesus, after he resurrected in 2 John 7, 8. We read that there was a group of people who didn't believe in Jesus simply because he was born on the earth, and here is the statement to those people. From the Apostle John came a warning, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, men who will not acknowledge the coming of Christ in the flesh. In the flesh, such a one is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now, how could it be that someone who thinks Jesus was coming on the clouds looks at Jesus, the man on earth, he says he's not the Christ? It's because the people were so fixed to the prophecy of Christ coming on the clouds. Not all the people, but a great number. And yet we read in Matthew 11:13, very important statement, for all the law and the prophets prophesied until John. John the Baptist was the veritable end of the Old Testament. John baptizing Jesus transferred the mantle of the Old Testament onto Jesus. Jesus began a new providential era. Nobody before the time of Jesus ever conceived of a second coming. Not until our Lord began to speak of it himself, which was after he began his ministry. Nobody thought of a second coming. It would have been impossible. It would have been impossible. It would have been impossible for the Israelites to think Jesus would come once, be crucified, and come again. In hindsight, as Christians, we look back into history and we can see that Jesus came. He was predicted to come. And we then sometimes say that the book of Daniel talks about Jesus' second coming. But again, my friend, please remember, all the law and prophets prophesied until John. And I'll refer again to Romans 10 and 4. Romans 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law that everyone who has faith may be justified. This is incredible. This means that even at the time of our Lord's coming, there were two completely different perspectives of how he would come. We can learn a great lesson from this. How could it be that it states he would come in the clouds? You know, Jesus said himself that he came from heaven. I, I like this one a lot. You know, John 3.13. John 3.13. No one has ascended into heaven, but the Son of Man who descended from heaven. How is it that Jesus himself said that he came from heaven? Jesus was born in the womb of his mother Mary. Perhaps you saw the movie Superman. In that movie you see what may be described as a, a very interesting American image of salvation. Not so religious, but an interesting literary image in which Superman comes from another planet and zooms around the orbit of the Earth, 
breaks through the atmosphere and lands in the fields of Ma and Pa Kent. He grows up to be a miraculous savior type being. Now, Jesus did not come out of the ionosphere or through the atmosphere like a comet, like Superman. He came as a person born in the womb of his mother Mary, born of the Holy Spirit, certainly true, certainly. He had no connection to the lineage of Adam by sin. But yet Jesus stated he came from heaven. What did he mean? What does he mean when he says he comes from heaven? You've probably had an experience when people walk into your congregation, to your chapel, and for, perhaps for the very first time someone visits your church, and the husband then says to the wife who are visiting, oh dear, this is just such a beautiful chapel. There's such a high feeling. The reason there's a high feeling is not because your members of your congregation are floating up on the ceiling like helium balloons. It's a high feeling because the spirit is high. And conversely, you go into some place where it's dark and dreary, and someone says, it's pretty low, let's get out of here. Doesn't mean it's low because people are groveling around the floor like alligators, but because the spirit is low. When the spirit is high, we feel close to God. When the spirit is low, we feel depressed. Could it not be that our Lord was using an analogy when he said he came from heaven in John 3.13 because he said it, I didn't. He said he came from heaven. Again, we've got to be careful to examine the Holy Bible from the perspective of God. That's why we can see in this modern day, this modern era that God wants us to see inside the meaning of the Bible. As though the Bible were written in a code as though we're fighting a war and God is the commander-in-chief and he sends messages to his people, his spies, out in the satanic fields. He reveals his messages to us when we're ready. In Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets through his servants, the prophets. We can see these two views of the Old Testament perspective of Jesus' coming. And I'd like to now turn our attention to some references in the New Testament, if you'll let me. We'll turn to the book of Luke in chapter 17, verse 24. And we're going to look at several verses here that I want to share with you from the standpoint that these verses somehow m seem to indicate that Jesus may come back as he came the first time. Now, I'll admit this, this is going to be a bit provocative, but yet we've got to be clear with the prophecies that we find in the New Testament. Because according to some of them, there's no way that Jesus can come back in a supernatural fashion. Absolutely, it's okay to believe that. If we interpret the Bible literally, that, of course, it's everybody's right to believe as they wish. But sometimes we've got to be careful. You know, uh, it might make more sense if there is a view of the Bible that has depth and that seems to indicate a different tone than simply the literal surface trans translation or interpretation, then at least we can look at both views. For example, let's imagine Jesus does come back on the clouds, absolutely up there in the cumulus clouds, and if it happens in this next moment, I know that I will go up through this building somehow, through this studio, and meet him in the clouds. But that passage may also mean something more realistic than we have until now thought. So it seemed reasonable to be safe to understand both views. Well, let's look at Luke 17 and 24, where we read, So the Son of Man will be in his day, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. If Jesus comes back on the clouds literally, as it is mentioned in the first book of Thessalonians 4.17, then how is it that he would suffer? How is it that he would suffer at the hands of this generation? This is a reference to the second advent. The only way he could suffer is if Jesus comes back in a way that would put him in the position to have a difficult time of achieving oneness with the people of faith of that era. Precisely as the precedent we examined in the last lecture shows us with Moses and the Israelite people, Moses tried to establish the covenant with the people 
hooking them into God. And when the people unhooked themselves and became faithless, God has no other alternative but to look to another person, another group. In this last day time, in this latter day era, if Jesus comes back in a way that is unexpected, if he comes back life a thief in the night, if he comes back in a way that is challenging to us, in other words, if he comes back as a man born on earth, that is when Christ will suffer. The reason is because Jesus' Jesus's course 2,000 years ago was a course of lamentable suffering for him. When he comes again, the sin of faithlessness has to be restored by the people of faith of this era. There's a passage in the book of Revelation 12, verse 5. And she brought forth a male child. One is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. It says very specifically here that Christ will come as a male child through the birth of a woman. The rod of iron represents the truth, the word of God. We could believe that that means that God will give us a new word, a new message. He will reveal himself in his fullness. Let's continue. In the book of uh, Luke, chapter 17 and 20, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, Jesus told his disciples. Well, what would be the greatest sign of the world is if Jesus comes in the clouds so that everybody sees him and everybody goes up who is faithful, who has been saved. If Jesus comes in the clouds like that, if you're saved, then certainly you'll see it. If you're not saved, and if you don't go up, then you'll see the people who do go up. They'll vanish. The only way that that prophecy can make sense is that the kingdom of God will come invisibly, carefully. The kingdom of heaven is in the midst of you. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Jesus said. The point here is that the reason why there will be no signs to observe is because Christ comes in an invisible way. Christ comes as a person who will restore the failure of Adam, who comes as the tree of life, Revelations 22, 14. There's another passage in the New Testament I'd like to share with you before we go on, and that's Luke 18, 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Jesus asked his disciples. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Why would our Lord worry or concern himself with his disciples in this fashion? Why would he question whether there will be faith on earth when he returns? If everyone will go up into the air with him, it seems as though that would be automatic based on our faith. But then Jesus is talking about the situation in which he comes back on the earth and he actually has to build a foundation around him. Now, 2,000 years ago, the Israelite people uh, were very faithful, to say the least. They fasted, they prayed, they tithed, they offered their, their sacrifices, they followed the Mosaic tradition. And yet, when our Lord came upon the earth, did their faith bear fruits of goodness? Not at all. And the reason why Jesus says that when he comes again, will he find faith on earth? It's because as Christians, we have got to be very careful. We have got to be really careful today because God wants to use Christianity. God wants to use our churches. God wants to bring the Christian family together and stand upon that family. And even though we call ourselves saved, and even though we say the name of Jesus, we've read the scripture and we know that we may say, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. I prophesied in your name. And you know what he will say back to us if our heart isn't pure. Consequently, we can learn based upon the purpose of creation that when Jesus comes back, he must come on the foundation of the earth because that's where the kingdom of heaven is meant to be established first. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. From this standpoint, today, Jesus is looking at us, and in one sense, we, we can't deny the fact that sometimes he has to weep when he sees the lamentable situation of the church. We are divided. We are bigoted. In so many ways, the mind and the body of the church, the word and the deed, are still too far apart. Still, we try to do our best. And yet, let's remember here, if there's a possibility that this information is true, if there's the possibility that this content is really from God, then it is incredible hope. It means we can have hope. We can really be the people today that make the difference for God's providence. Now, I'm going to share a few insights here about the principal viewpoint of the second coming of Christ. We've talked about the scripture. We've looked at the precedence of history. And now we're going to examine this revelation foundation, this new idea here of the principle. First of all, Adam was supposed to establish the tree of life upon the earth. Adam would have done that by accomplishing the three blessings, of course, with Eve. Then how would the three blessings have been established without a physical body? Adam would have needed his mind and body harmonized, centered on God's words. And in order for that mind and body to be established in harmony with God's words, Adam needed a mind and a body. I know it sounds really simple, but in order for Jesus to truly establish the victory of Adam on the earth, he had to come as a man, the Word incarnate. Well, then, if all mankind is meant to be fruitful, how could it be that Jesus doesn't come back to show us how to be fruitful? So that the life element from God and the unity with our body, the vitality elements, can truly be established on the earth. Ultimately, we understand that the kingdom of God upon the earth will be established in an ideal family. Then a true Adam, true Eve, unite together in the position of what is entitled true parents. In order for Christ to establish the kingdom of heaven upon the earth, the ideal of love that Adam and Eve should have created has to be built upon the earth. God so much wants to be inside of families. God wants to live inside of our families. Now, in order for Christ to do that, he's got to be on the earth. And finally, in order to establish the three blessings, the third blessing is to have dominion over the earth. In order to do that, Jesus has to come back so that the true foundation of unity with the creation can occur. Now, the main mission of Judaism was not only to receive Jesus, but he was to follow. The Judaic people were to follow Jesus and help Jesus in his mission to establish the kingdom of heaven. Let's recall another important tenet, tenet in, 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 in unificationism, and that is the issue of human responsibility. The Judaic people united with Jesus would form the foundation of the victory of man's responsibility, woman's responsibility, and on that basis, the kingdom of heaven would have emerged at that time. In order for that responsibility to be established, Jesus needed a body on the earth since the earth was where the sin occurred. And the Judaic people should have united with Jesus to fulfill their mission together. Let's not forget the covenant. Let's not be dreamy anymore. The covenant is a real contract between ourselves in our lives and God in heaven then we need a spiritual and physical body to establish that covenant here upon the earth. Now the important area to discuss. When Jesus comes back, he comes not to save Christians. He doesn't come to help the church. The church is there as his foundation so that he can come and work through the church and reach out to the ends of the world. The church is his base. The church is his bride. The church is like his body then Christianity exists for the single purpose of becoming the reflection of Jesus. 
Christianity exists for the sake of God's will being made real, to be, make God's will real in the world. That's what Christianity comes from. That's the motivation. Then when Jesus comes back, if we dare think he comes simply to save me so that I will have a niche in the kingdom of heaven, we will make a tragic error. You've studied the gospel probably longer than I've been alive. But still, I've got to say, from the bottom of my heart, we can't make the mistake of thinking that Jesus comes for me alone. Jesus lives for the world, as we read in John 3.16. We've shared that passage many times in this series. The point here is that we exist for Jesus. Jesus exists for God. When he comes back as Christians, he must issue in the kingdom of heaven. Praise God for that. And yet, the kingdom of heaven is not going to be the project of Jesus alone. Building the kingdom. Let's use the analogy of building a building. Let's say Jesus Christ is the one who actually is the uh, contractor, the superintendent of the job. Jesus comes and he's going to need plumbers. He's going to need electricians. He's going to need uh, architects. He's going to need engineers. He's going to need the people to put the paint on the walls. He's going to be the guys who put in the carpet, the ones who bring in the furniture, the interior decorators. Where are they all going to come from? Where are they going to come from? From Christianity. And if we continue in the selfish paths that we have been living, fighting among each, amongst each other, thinking about Jesus only in a way from a childlike viewpoint, we could risk historical failure. Now I know, I, I think it was Martin Luther who said that a sermon was not any good unless it really roused people to the point that they would end up feeling upset and disturbed even from the pastor. But we've got to face the facts today that Christ is coming and he will build his kingdom, but he needs Christianity to establish that kingdom. And that means that the sins that are perpetrated in the world, immorality, drug abuse, pornography, injustice, the breakdown of the family, good Lord, when we look at our world, it's like a trash heap. The problem of communism, who is going to solve those problems today? That is the hope of the second coming. That's the hope, and that's why as Christians we've got to be aware of how Jesus will return. Then the conclusion from this is that he will come based upon the earth. He will come as a new man with a new name that only is known by himself, as it speaks of in Revelation. Well, let's bring it down to the final issue here of how Christ will come, and that's the issue of, of the clouds. Why in the world did our Lord speak of the clouds if he was going to be born upon the earth? Like John the Baptist came as the second coming of Elijah, if Jesus comes again working through a new man in this age, why did he bring up the clouds? Now, let's refer to Revelation 17, 15, in which we read, The waters that you saw, seated next to which is the harlot, are the people's nations, tongues, and kings. Now, this, as we know, refers to the fallen world. Clouds exist when water rises out of the surface of the earth and into the air, vaporized, purified. Clouds, therefore, represent the purified saints who are resurrected in the latter days. The clouds represent the people around whom Jesus is the center. It mentions in the book of Hebrews 12, verse 1, that the history of the course of righteous figures is a cloud of witnesses. When we rise up, it means we rise up in value. We rise up in faith. It does not have to mean, although it could, it could mean that we go up literally in the air. It may mean that. But it also may mean that it is a realistic, spiritual, ethical, moral change that we make in our life. And that's the view unificationism will take. 
that Jesus comes on the clouds, and the clouds are those resurrected saints of the last days, people who live for the sake of God in truly an unselfish fashion, not in a religious fashion that is merely words or simple actions. As someone once said that going to, ch to think you're a Christian because you go to church on Sunday is the same as thinking that you're an automobile because you go into a garage. Dr. Martin Luther King told us, any religion that professes to be concerned with the souls of men and is not concerned with the slums that, da that damn them or the economic conditions that strangle them or the social conditions that cripple them is a dry-as-dust religion. We're in a time when Christianity needs a great revival, a great rebirth, and we see the work of God and the Holy Spirit happening around us. Well, then why did Lord Jesus tell us of the clouds? He knew that if he spoke to them frankly, they would have a very rough time having hope. Didn't Jesus tell him that, uh, for truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes? And we read in Matthew 16, 28, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Praise God. Our Lord said that, and yet we have not seen him. Could we say that Jesus lied? Of course we can't. Well, then what did he mean by those statements? Why did he say he was coming soon, and yet we haven't seen him yet? Obviously, knowing the path of persecution that his followers would go through, Jesus had to give them hope. He was their parent. He had to give them encouragement. He had to give them a bolt of energy that would secure them on their path of suffering. And that's the reason he said to us he would be coming soon. That's the reason he told us he would be coming in the clouds. He gave us a hopeful vision. If he said, I'm going to be coming in about 2,000 years on the earth, and you're going to have to endure all this suffering, well then, how would we feel? How would you feel if you were a Christian facing the persecution of Rome and you knew that Jesus wasn't going to come in 2,000 years? Obviously. He also said the same in order to prevent the delusion of antichrists, people that rise up and claim that they were the Messiah. Consequently, we see that the way Christ will return is he will be coming through the earth that Jesus, who is in the spiritual world, in the position of the Son of God, in the position of the victorious and triumphant Christ, will work through another man who shows a certain qualification of faith. And through that other man, Jesus will commission that person to bring about that everlasting kingdom. In that sense, Jesus will return through a man born on earth. And I've got to mention here, I know that that's provocative, and I know that this is going to take prayer, but I, I pray to God, please don't shut it out. Don't exclude it so quickly. Now, let's deal with the situation of when Christ will come. When Christ will come. We read in Amos 3.7, Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets through his servants, the prophets. In Matthew 24.36, Jesus says, But of that day and hour no one knows, indicating it would be fruitless to speculate about when he would return. And yet there have been many examples of when God reveals his plans to us on earth. Didn't he reveal them to Noah? Didn't he tell the people at the time that he was about to cast a judgment? Wasn't it true at the time of Lot? He told Lot about Sodom and Gomorrah. At the time of John the Baptist, and even when Jesus was born, there were many who knew that Christ was coming. If the coming of the Lord of the Second Advent is the single most important event in history, doesn't it make sense that God would reveal to us when that time would come? I believe, as I hope you will understand through the content of the principle of restoration, that God has revealed how Christ will come, and he has revealed when. To state the conclusion, that time is now. Today, in this century, in this moment, when Christianity is coming to its fruition, we must be ready and waiting for Christ's return. 
Now, I will refer to the principle of restoration through indemnity. That is, if we fail to accomplish a certain purpose, we have to restore it at a later time. The course of Israel from Abraham to Jesus was a course traditionally described as six phases of time, six phases of history. I refer here to the era of the slavery in Egypt, which lasted approximately 400 years, followed by the age of the judges, again 400 years, followed by the United Kingdom, and here we have 120 years in which Saul, then David, then Solomon attempted to build the temple. The temple was not able to be constructed, and out of faithlessness, the people were divided into the north and the south, normally referred to as the era of the divided kingdom. God sent many prophets and holy men to restore the unity of, of the Judeo Jewish people. In the end, the Jewish people were taken into captivity, or a number of them were taken into captivity uh, into Babylon. And eventually they were freed after 70 years, eventually coming back to Canaan, where on the foundation of the work of people like Malachi, the temple was established on the earth for the first time. And in a righteous manner, the people united with the temple and made the final foundation of substance for the sake of the coming of the Messiah. In that final era of 400 years, the chosen people endured tremendous external ordeals. They were invaded by a number of different uh, forces and, and, and empires, and they also offered their sacrifices and they established their faith internally. Eventually, John the Baptist came, and John was the one to then bring this foundation as a landing pad to stand beneath Jesus. Jesus came, and that foundation, as we have shown several times, failed to receive him as the Son of God. Jesus absorbed that failure. He digested it. He indemnified it. He took the position of the suffering servant, the suffering Lord. He hung upon the cross, and he won victory over the hatred of the people, over the sin of faithlessness, and was resurrected into paradise, opening the gate for spiritual salvation. The single most important sin at the time would be the fact that we rejected the Messiah. To reject the Messiah was to betray the covenant. The covenant was based upon the word of God. It was repeating the fall. It was repeating the sinful history. It was never intended by God even though our Father could see the possibility. So then what does Jesus do? Does he give up? We know that he didn't give up, and thank God, thank God that he didn't give up. He began a new phase of history. That's the Christian era. That's why we can say that Christianity is the new Israel. And then God began a course of rebuilding that foundation, now not on a national level, but on a worldwide basis. And there we find the fundamental purpose of Christianity today is it, it is a global foundation for the Messiah's coming. That's who you are. That's who you are as a Christian. Now let's examine the path of history that Christianity has traversed. We find in the first 400 years, until the time of Theodosius, a persecution in the Roman Empire. Bloodshed poured out into the streets, followed by the age of the church patriarch after Christianity had been accepted as the state religion of Rome. We move to the age of the patriarchs where Christianity began to develop was followed by the Christian kingdom in which Charlemagne was crowned as the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And the hope there was to establish the ideal of the temple, so to speak, through Christianity in Europe. That era came to a close through disunity, the pope, the king, the king's sons and grandsons. And eventually came the era of the divided Christian kingdom, the Dark Ages, 
Europe was, th was thrust into a split between East and West Franks. And that period of time lasted until even the papacy had been taken out of Rome and put in southern France in the town of Avignon and finally moved back. The Catholic Church at the time played a very significant role in God's providence. We must not discount that fact. And yet the church had become somewhat corrupted. No one can deny that. And finally, a reformer came, a Catholic himself, a professor in Germany, Martin Luther. And Luther laid out his 95 theses. He then caused the reformation of the Christian kingdom, the Protestant Reformation. And God began to issue in a new spirit into Christianity in Europe. In the last 400 years from the time of Martin Luther until today, in 1517 until today, has been 400 years of a period in which the world has been prepared for Christ's coming. Scientifically, technologically, socially, economically, politically, so in, in every way, we can find amazing preparation for a time in which the ideal of creation can be planted upon the earth. Let's draw the conclusion here. The parallels between these ages of Abraham to Jesus and Jesus to the Lord of the Second Coming are such that we can see the operation of the principle of restoration through indemnity. What Israel could not fulfill has had to have been taken by Christianity to be fulfilled. Consequently, the time period of indemnity, the time period of preparation of roughly 1930 years, according to the Old Testament, has been fulfilled. We find from the time of Martin Luther of 1517 until the present day, after those 400 years of preparation, we come to the, the date of 1917. Why is that important? It's simply important because a phase of preparation is concluded there. Oddly enough, the Bolshevik Revolution started. A new phase of history began of a world level. The conclusion here is not that Christ was born on earth in 1930. That's not the conclusion. But it does mean that somehow, according to this view of history, which is aiming merely to show a trend, that it is possible that according to this principle, God could work his new hope on the earth. New life could come. And if you go into a dark room and light a match, once you light that match, the room changes. The moment that Christ comes, no matter how desolate it looks to us today, that is the beginning of a new dawn. Now, in Jesus' case, it took him 30 years before he began to emerge and proclaim his mission. Could it not be the same? If Christ comes again in this fashion, he will wait until he prepares. He will wait until the world is prepared and then appear to the world. Consequently, we can say, according to this principle, we are not waiting for the coming of Christ. We are waiting for the appearance of our Lord. We've talked about the question of how. We've talked about the question of when. Let's now examine the most intriguing question of where Christ will come. In the parable of the vineyard in Matthew 21, verse 33, we read that God is the owner of a vineyard. The vineyard is uh, being kept by a group of tenants who kill the servants who come to gather the uh, goods from the fields and then eventually kill the son of the, 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 of the owner of the vineyard. The owner of the vineyard then takes the uh, tenants and moves them out and gives the field to people who will bear fruits of that field. We commonly refer to that story as referring to the nature of the shift from the providence of Israel to the providence of Christianity. I'd like to draw your attention to the scripture in Revelation 7, 4 that states that at the time of the second coming, 144,000 will be drawn from the tribes of Israel and sealed. What does this mean? What does this mean? The name Israel could be misleading. Many of us think Christ will come in the nation of Israel in the Middle East. And yet, 
Let's examine where the name Israel comes from. It stems from the victory that Jacob won over the angel. And in that case, the name itself refers to one who is strived with God, one who is the victor of faith. Is it not in the book of Romans 9, 6, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, St. Paul. And in Matthew 3 and 9, do, do not presume to say to ourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able to raise up from these stones children of Abraham. Revel in, in Romans 11, 11, we read, through their trespass, referring to the chosen people of Israel, salvation has come to the Gentiles so to make Israel jealous. What has happened here is that the people of Israel were standing in the foundation to receive the Messiah, and it was not successful, and God had to raise up a new foundation, and that is the essential purpose of Christianity to be the landing pad for Christ when he returns. That's the reason we have been called to the ministry. That's the reason we've been called to the gospel. Now in Luke 17, 37, we read, when Jesus was asked where he would come, he answered metaphorically, where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. He certainly didn't specify which country. Again, let's recall this new view of what the meaning of Israel is. Israel is a person who is a man or a woman of true faith, not someone who necessarily is from a particular genealogical background or a particular racial or cultural background. Now, in the book of Revelations, we read again in 7 verse 2, it says that an angel would ascend from the rising of the sun, in other words, a reference to the Eastern world. To state the conclusion, and I offer this prayerfully with the hope that you as a brother or sister in Christ will receive this prayerfully, understanding that it is provocative, that the nation to which Christ will come will be a nation in the Eastern world, and that nation will be Korea. Now I can imagine what you're thinking. And if, in fact, God chose any particular country in the world to issue in this new movement, this new age, this new view of life, there must be preparation there that undeniably can be shown. We are reasonable people. I'm not going to sell my life for 12 years or the rest of my life for something that isn't real or isn't true. And it certainly has to be based on something that is guided by prayer. Now, if a farmer takes a tree from one end of his tree, from one end of his farmyard, and moves it to another end, there's got to be preparation. You've got to go over there and dig the hole and put in the mulch and all the fertilizer and all those kinds of, of things and prepare the situation. And then you plant the tree in the hole, having prepared it. What kind of preparation is there in the land that I mentioned? I'm going to mention five ideas here, and I offer these not as any logical proof, but merely as tendencies, merely as uh, testimonies of how God has worked in this particular nation. And ultimately, I might say, quite frankly, the best way to examine whether or not that nation is of a special dispensational purpose is go and visit. Go there and see for yourself. Nonetheless, first of all, God is a God of suffering. God is a God who has been aching in history to achieve his ideal. Consequently, in order to understand God, we go through a period of suffering. Isn't that true? It's often said that people who suffer the most have the more pure heart and are able to deal with God and feel God because they have gone through a similar experience as God. Now, that nation has certainly endured incredible trials. I've been told that 85, 86 times the nation has been invaded by other countries. It has never once historically invaded itself, invaded another land, but it has been attacked, and yet it has been able to endure its homogeneous culture. It's been able to endure its language. It has been able to provide 
as we find often in the Orient, but in Korea, a very unique fashion of the sanctity of the family, regardless of what religious faith, the sanctity of the family. There are so many elements of, it, of the culture that are truly uh, fascinating to behold. In order that a nation be the uh, foundation for God to work in a special fashion, the nation has to be in resonance with God's heart. And that's why we mention this aspect of uh, the course of suffering. God could never send his messenger to a land that was merely luxurious and pleasure-ridden, focused only on the me or the here and now. Secondly, it is significant that the land to which Christ would come would bear fruit of all religions. This means Christ does not come, as I said, only for Christians. It doesn't, he doesn't come just to save those of us who have been going to church faithfully, but he comes on the foundation of Christianity to reach the world. Consequently, all religions of goodness have been founded by God's grace. Even though Christianity is in the central position, because Jesus comes as the Christ and teaches us of God as a, teaches us of God as a father, Still, all religions are going to be bound together someday. If God is one and Christ is one, there's got to be one body of God's children. Therefore, the land that bears fruit of God's uh, providence has to be a land in which the nerve endings, so to speak, bind together and can be touched. And here, the land we mentioned does qualify. It's not to say that others don't, but at least the testimony does bear witness. Thirdly, we find that God will send his son. God will work his providence in a place where there is a front line between the power of evil and the power of good. This front line is born out of the Garden of Eden when God gave us the commandment. To stand on one side of the commandment and obey means we are alive. And to stand on the other side is the way of death. Consequently, a true religious person has to face life and death in their life of faith. And in this land we've talked about, we find a conflict of world powers. The principality of darkness and the principality of light face each other in the struggle today, in this century, between the forces of communism and the free world centered on God. The fourth issue I'd like to draw to your attention is the nation to which the Lord will come has to bear fruits in terms of the providence of indemnity. It's interesting that Israel had to go through this 40-year path in the wilderness or 400 years in, the, in Egypt before Moses could come. 400 years between the time of Malachi building the temple and Jesus' arrival. Christianity went through a similar period of 400 years after our Lord was crucified. And in the same fashion, from 1905 to 1945, Korea was under the bondage and dominion of Japan, imperialistic Japan, before World War II, and was eventually liberated uh, by the end of World War II. In that time, there were a great many people, especially Christians, who were mercilessly slaughtered. Finally, the area where God works his providence has to be spiritually sensitized. People have to have the gifts of the Spirit. And in the, in the last days, as we read in Acts, God will pour forth His Spirit. We've seen that happen in Korea in a most unique fashion. Prophetic examples, an expectation that somehow, some way, Korea is a special place. Well, this brings us then to a, a, a summary here. The point being that these five issues I've brought up are in no way meant to be a solid empirical proof. Good Lord, who could prove the issues we're talking about? And yet, I offer them to you as a humble, sincere testimony of faith. And again, without prayer and without deeper investigation, we can't form any conclusion. Let's talk for a moment here about the similarity between the age of Jesus and the time of today from the standpoint of the providence of restoration. These two eras have incredible parallels. First of all, the central nation that Jesus came to 
in the old era was Israel. Judaism was the religion, and Rome was the base upon the earth that Christ wanted to use. In today's world, Judaism is played in the, the role of Judaism as the central faith is taken by Christianity. The role of Israel is played by the movement of Christianity. And the role of Rome is played by America. America has a providential destiny should we realize it and fulfill that destiny. The position of the Christian people in this era is identical to the position of the Israelite people 2,000 years ago. And again, that's why we say we've got to be so careful and humble in this day and age. Like children, new wine goes into new wineskins. New ideas, new thoughts, a new view of life could never be appreciated for what is there unless it is absorbed into a new wineskin. Our minds have to be open. Our minds have to be uh, truly uh, prayerful. At the time of the Second Coming, the new teachings and the Reformation activities of Christ will be opposed, certainly, by the believers who refuse to accept the fact that the times have changed and that God is working in a new way. A new culture will eventually emerge, emerge centering upon God. Now this brings us to the conclusion of this series of videotapes. Our Lord taught us that we should take up His cross, take up our cross, follow Him, willing to sacrifice our life in order to find our life. It was Jesus, our Lord, who taught us that we should feed His sheep. And the issue that we find in today's world is that Christianity truly does need a revival. There's a passage by a, a, a Christian uh, pr a professor, Bernard Bell, I'd like to share. He writes, I should like to see the Christian leaders disregard their timid followers and like Francis of Assisi or John Wesley, go out of the church buildings, go out of the church buildings and shake the dust of denominationalism off their feet. Appeal to the folks generally, he says. And he concludes, Americans will listen to religion if and when it claims to have a relationship with real life. Let the churches recognize that their job is not simply to nurture the faithful and the saved, but their job is to rouse, convict of sin, and convert a pagan nation. Reverend Moon, in the foundation of his ministry, prayed to comfort the heart of God. He prayed to solve the suffering of Jesus Christ. I know that may be difficult to comprehend sometimes, but the relationship he had with Jesus was one of heart in which tears come because you feel how much Jesus' hope was and how little our response was. The three obstacles that faced God's providence today, that do face us now, again, is the breakdown of love, the division and impotency, impotency of Christianity, and the problem of communism. Concerning denominationalism, Reverend Moon never, ever intended to start another church. Please don't think that the Unification Church is another church, another denomination which one can choose. It is meant and exists as a movement to bring a new message to the body of Christianity. The commitment to Christianity is expressed in Reverend Moon's own words when he says, we know the proper basic role for Christians in society from the life and the mission of Jesus. Jesus came as the Word of God incarnate. And Reverend Moon's hope is to live as Jesus lived. With that, I conclude by offering my thanks and gratitude to you for listening to these tapes and pray that one day we might meet, but most importantly, that you pray to see the truthfulness of the content of this principle. God bless you, and may God bless your congregation and your family. Thank you very much.